Good afternoon. It is my great pleasure to open this academic ceremony of Maastricht University. My name is Jan Smits, Dean of the Faculty of Law, and I welcome everyone present here today in this beautiful aula of our university. And I welcome all colleagues watching this ceremony online. I know you are with many. Very much welcome. I welcome in particular also our colleague, Professor Bruno de Witte, Vierle, Marnix and Flores, all sitting here on the first row. In a few minutes, I'm going to ask Professor de Witte to come forward to give his valedictory address, the afscheidsrede, as we say in Dutch, a truly academic tradition, and the way to say farewell, at least officially, to the academic community. In your case, Bruno, you do so after having been with us at our university for 33 years. You were appointed on the 1st of July, 1989, as Associate Professor of Recht van de Europese Gemeenschappen, very soon thereafter becoming full professor in what was back then still a very small faculty. In the 33 years that followed, you performed the many roles that academics have as a teacher, as a researcher, as a supervisor, and to many within the department and the faculty, also as a mentor and friend. As a real mentor, providing the intellectual and personal feedback that makes people feel appreciated and stimulated. Meaning that you acted, not the way in which you would qualify this yourself, um, but I do, acted in fact as a magnet for many talented people from around Europe who wanted to work with you here in Maastricht. This is of course, and has always been a cooperation with many others, but this did result in the Maastricht Faculty of Law becoming one of the main centers for the study of European law. So today we certainly do not celebrate your leaving us um, in the faculty. And luckily you will also remain with us as an emeritus professor, but we do celebrate the many things that you did so far in your career and that made a lasting impact on colleagues and on your academic field. Professor De Witte, I now invite you to come forward to give your valedictory address. Dear Dean, dear colleagues and friends, dear family, a major advantage of farewell lectures compared to inaugural lectures is that the audience doesn't expect to hear about ambitious research plans or about innovative teaching ideas. Instead, it's fine for the speaker to just talk about the past. The risk, however, is to bore the audience with events and anecdotes from the past that no one else remembers because nobody was there. <laughs> so let me therefore talk about a subject of current interest in European law. And there are many such subjects, of course. European law never gets boring. But I've decided not to choose a particular topic of institutional or substantive EU law. Instead, what I would like to do in this lecture is to present you some reflections on a question that has been nagging me and others for a while. And that question is, what is in this field of study, European Union law, what is the proper role of academic scholars? And how specifically do they or should they relate to the work of the practitioners of European law who work in the various institutions of the European Union, in the Court of Justice, the Commission, the European Parliament, the Council, and the many other bodies and agencies of the EU? Now, this kind of question is situated in a growing subfield within the academic field of European Union law. And that is a subfield that deals with self-reflection about the academic field itself. What is it that we're doing when we do European law? For instance, there are more and more contributions on the research methods to be used in dealing with EU law. 
And there are also contributions by legal scholars on what one could call the sociology and politics of EU law as an academic discipline. And I guess that my talk this afternoon fits in that category. It is about, to use these grand words, it is about the sociology and politics of EU law as an academic discipline. But seen from one particular angle, which I already mentioned, and that angle is the way in which EU law academic research is intertwined with the legal work accomplished by the European institutions. Many of you, like me, are part of a distinct social field in which knowledge of European law is produced. That's what we do. That knowledge is, however, co-produced. It's produced on the one hand by those whose profession it is to produce knowledge, that is, scholars who are mostly based at universities. But it's also produced by those whose profession is to practice European law, by making law, applying law, interpreting European law. By doing this, they also produce new knowledge. These practitioners work in law firms, in business organizations, in civil society organizations, and also, above all, in the institutions of the European Union. And it's that group, the latter group, that interests me this afternoon. How does this co-production of EU law knowledge work between academics and legal practitioners based in the EU institutions? So there is here a mutual engagement which leads often to close encounters between these two groups of lawyers. I will look at that in two steps. I will first look at and try to describe how the institutions act towards and within academia. And the second step will be to look at how academics deal with the institutions. And in both directions, I would argue, there are indeed close encounters. Let me start, though, by noting something really obvious that does take me back to the past, to the times when I first heard about European law. And that obvious thing is that the academic study of European law did not exist until the European institutions were created. The emergence of this academic field of European law that we know today was made possible by the fact that the early European community treaties created permanent institutions with real powers who could act independently from the member states. So that's what was called back then in the 1960s the supranational character of the European communities. And this justified the emergence of an academic subfield within international law and distinct from international law. So the early generations of European law scholars, you know, the, the ones who preceded even me, you know, <laughs> they were very closely connected to the fate of the new European institutions. And so they gave their intellectual support also to the institutions, whose existence, after all, justified their own academic existence, their academic autonomy from international law. And that autonomy became visible gradually, starting in the 1960s through the creation of dedicated chairs of European law, specialized journals like Common Market Law Review that was you know, founded in the early 1960s. And this happened in countries, especially countries like the Netherlands, Belgium, and France, and then slowly it spread to other European countries. Now today, 60 years later, European law, European Union law, is firmly established as an academic discipline on its own. But some people think that this umbilical cord connecting the early EU law scholars to the European institutions was never cut. And that today, these two groups are still together, that academics are still natural and mostly uncritical supporters of the European integration project and of the way in which that project is conducted by the EU institutions at any moment in time. I will get, get back to this reproach later on. Let me now return to the first step of my description, namely to, to the main ways in which EU institutions engage with the academic world, and especially with 
the little world of EU law scholarship. The first way in which they do so is through money. The European institutions have always given, and are still giving, financial support to EU legal scholarship. And they do so in many different ways. Through the funding of the European documentation centers. That's something that goes back to the 1960s also. So that European universities got these documentation centers on European affairs paid, funded in large extent by the European communities. These were made conditional, interestingly, upon the existence of teaching and research on European integration in the hosting institutions. Then you had the funding, temporary funding, of the Jean Monnet chairs in European law. This is, this is a, a scheme which was launched in 1989, and I should disclose here that I was an early beneficiary of one of them in the early 90s here in Maastricht. And later we got these Jean Monnet centers of excellence as well. Then you have the funding of collective and individual research in the form, for example, of consultations requested by the EU institutions on particular topics. You know, they say, we need a study on this or that. Can you produce it? And you'll be paid for it. Or in the form of projects funded from the general European Union budget through the Horizon, Marie Curie, Jean Monnet, and ERC grants. Also, through the funding of specialized academic institutions, such as the College of Europe, or the European University Institute, where the study of European law came to occupy a central place. And even the EU has been funding specialized journals, such as, for example, the excellent European Equality Law Review. So it's clear from this that the European Union, especially the Commission then, has actively and deliberately pursued the development of a specifically European dimension in the social sciences. So not just in law, but also in political science, in history, economics, and so on. It also means that most EU law scholars, at one moment or other, have benefited from European Union funding for their research or teaching activities. And some of us, like myself, have directly or indirectly benefited from EU financial support throughout their whole career. Next to this, next to financial support, a second way in which the institutions engage with EU law scholarship is when their members act like scholars themselves. Indeed, many practitioners of EU law are former academics, and some of them teach EU law courses at universities. Some of them publish textbooks on EU law, as we know. Many of them publish articles in law journals. They give visiting lectures. They speak at academic conferences. Sometimes they sit in the editorial board of journals. So there's an active presence there in the academic field, which I, on the whole, find useful. But it has been criticized. So this active presence of practitioners has been described in the literature uh, several times, most recently in an article by Pei Vileno, here present in the journal European Law Open. What we see there is an intellectual and social proximity between the world of scholarship and the world of legal practice. And it's a proximity which is more obvious than in most legal disciplines, I would say. Certainly much more marked than in international law. Now, there is a thin demarcation line there, which is marked by this ritual sentence which the practitioners from the EU institutions use when they publish. They always declare, and you know this formula, they declare that the views and opinions expressed in their contribution are personal and do not bind in any way the institution in which they work. This ritual sentence is actually useful for the academic audience because it signals the opposite of what it says. <laughs> it signals that we should be aware that however interesting and competent and useful those views are, they still stem from practitioners who owe a sense of loyalty to the institution for which they work. And we, the pure academics, I should say, we should read their publication in that light. A third way in which the EU institutions seek interaction with academics is by organizing a direct dialogue 
on a topic of common interest. My impression is that this happens more frequently than before. For example, only last week, the European Parliament and the European University Institute organized in Florence a policy dialogue called In Defense of Democracy in the EU Political System, with speakers from the European Parliament, from academia, and from think tanks. And next week, the European Commission organizes a workshop about its recent proposal for a European Media Freedom Act, where all the speakers will be academic scholars. In other words, what we see here is that the institution acts in listening mode. The institution pays and organizes. Those who speak are only academics. Now, in all these three modes of interaction, which I mentioned, so funding, direct participation, and organizing meetings, the European institutions have no problem in keeping a critical distance from what academics write or say. In fact, European institutions do not depend on legal scholarship in the same way as they depend on, for example, scientific expert knowledge on climate change or on energy prices. The difference is that the European institutions have their own legal expertise in-house. The Commission, the Council, the European Parliament, the European Central Bank have their own legal services, and many of their other officials who are not part of their legal service also have a legal training. And of course, the Court of Justice is entirely in the hands of jurists, both among the judges and among the referendaires. This diminishes the need to reach out for academic input in order to find solutions for their daily legal problems. Now, that doesn't mean that academic research is considered superfluous. It may occasionally have a policy impact, and sometimes we see concrete evidence of that. But we don't know very much about that. Generally speaking, we don't know to what extent EU law practitioners take note of or are being influenced by academic research. And also, you know, the lawyers working for the EU might be influenced by some views transmitted in academic writing, but then they have to work within their own hierarchies and within the context of the political choices imposed on them. Notes by the legal services of the EU institutions do not refer to legal writing, or only very exceptionally. But we do find numerous references to academic work in the impact assessment reports that today accompany new proposals for EU legislation. If you read these reports, you will see that there are many references to the work of academics, you know, often econ economists, um, social scientists, but also lawyers. The Court of Justice never refers to legal writing in its judgment, but the advocates general, at least some of them, refer to academic writing. And many of us have been secretly proud when one of our writings happened to be cited in an opinion of an advocate general, especially when cited approvingly. <laughs> Let me then look at the other side of the divide, namely at the way in which academics engage with the work of the European institutions. Now, the reasons why legal scholars are seeking close encounters with the EU's institutional life are diverse. But the main reason, the most obvious one, if you want, is that EU law academics based at universities also teach EU law. And teaching in law schools is supposed, in most cases, in most countries certainly, it's supposed to reflect the state of the law. And the state of European law depends on what the European institutions do. So EU law scholars must therefore necessarily take an interest in the activities of the legal practitioners in the EU institutions in order for their teaching to be relevant. And personally, I've always found it really interesting and useful to speak to um, you know, people from the institutional practice, to understand their reasoning, to understand what they, they were busy doing. And through teaching, then we, the academics, we diffuse legal knowledge to new generations of jurists, and that knowledge will then indirectly affect the work of the institutions in future years. 
This is what one could call the traditional virtuous circle of EU knowledge production. So the institutions make law, apply law, interpret law. The academics systematize it and transmit it to their students so as to prepare them in turn for making and applying EU law. And that explains why a lot of EU le legal writing is in explanatory mode. You know, it's about explaining things. Since EU law developments are often confusing and complicated, academics see it as their task to present developments in a structured way. And even though such presentations may include critical comments, the primary purpose is expository. It's to, to present things. Now, there's nothing wrong with this, I think. I've done a lot of this kind of writing myself, including not so long ago an article on the COVID recovery plan, NGU, where my principal task was, first of all, to try to understand myself what was happening, and then try to explain to the readers, students, fellow academics, what the European Union institutions had actually been doing, legally speaking, in those hectic COVID-dominated months of 2020. However, not all of us need to do this kind of work, and certainly not all the, all the time. The fact that we have to know what the EU institutions do in order to properly teach EU law and to properly write about EU law doesn't mean that our own research must be in this mode, in this explanatory mode. Many scholars instead approach the work of institutions in a critical mode or in a legal change mode in order to advocate improvements in European law. Now, such advocacy scholarship in EU law and other fields has recently been the object of a debate uh, that was sparked by the publication of articles by uh, Komarek and Gaitan. I've, I'm sure that many of, of you are familiar with that recent debate. I don't want to engage in it here, but my general view is that it is perfectly appropriate for legal scholars to advocate legal change. Jurists have always done that. It is reflected in the famous distinction between lex lata and lex ferenda. Traditionally, legal scholars would describe the law as it stood after some new judgment or some new piece of legislation, so the lex lata, and then towards the end of their piece, they would either say that they were entirely happy with these developments, or they would present their own view, their own better view, that should be adopted in the future. And that was the lex ferenda the law as it should be. So this has always been part of the, the sort of the kind of work of, of academic lawyers. What has changed these days is that advocates of legal change are supposed not to just state their own preferred views, but also make a sustained argument why those views are sound, possibly by reference to insights from social science or political philosophy. And of course, advocacy should never lead us to ignore or distort the legal reality. Advocating reform of the law, in my view, presupposes a sharp understanding of what the current state of the law is, because otherwise the advocacy will lead to nothing. That being said, many people do consider that EU legal research as a whole is not sufficiently critical of the work of EU institutions. The close ties between uh, legal scholars and legal practitioners in this field, which I described before, is not something of the past, but it continues to exist today. And it is a source of concern for some observers. For example, in the article by Pavy Leno that I mentioned before, she wrote that, I quote, EU legal academia should maintain a greater distance from the institutions and redefine its self-identity as a reflective and critical force, rather than one mainly focusing on legitimating EU action. At this point, I think we have to admit that most EU law scholars do feel supportive of the European integration project. Not for career reasons, not because of pressure exerted on them, but because of their personal trajectory 
Many European law academics work in other countries than their own. And if not, they have spent years abroad. They may have grown up in multinational families or created such a multinational family themselves. For them, for me, our own life is connected to the European integration process and to the new opportunities and experiences that it has created and facilitated. But even if you have spent all your working life in one country, in Spain or Sweden or wherever, the choice to become a scholar of European law is not an innocent one. It typically comes with a commitment to the project, to a sense that the European Union as an organization is a useful one in that it helps all its member states to face common challenges and that it helps in some way to preserve personal freedom and the welfare state. In my own case, I realized that this basically supportive stance towards European integration has influenced my thinking and my writing. It led me to participate in research projects which were launched and funded by the European Union, especially during the years I spent at the EUI in Florence. It also led me to support legal choices made in Brussels or in Luxembourg, which others found legally problematic. For example, last year I published that article in Common Market Law Review on the COVID recovery plan that I mentioned before. It was entitled, The European Union's COVID Recovery Plan, The Legal Engineering of an Economic Policy Shift. And the title implied, and I elaborated on that in the piece, it implied that I considered that the adoption of this recovery plan, the 750 billion euro plan, had been made possible by creative legal engineering from the side of the EU institutions and their legal services. And I argued that this legal creativity was acceptable and had been done for a good cause. More generally, in my view, the European Union needs to have the capacity to act in order to face numerous challenges that affect all its member states. I don't need to enumerate those challenges. And the treaty framework occasionally makes this difficult, and therefore some legal creativity is not only acceptable, but actually desirable. Others have criticized this position by emphasizing that our main task as academics is actually to critically control whether the court and the EU's political institutions respect the framework which the member states established when negotiating the European treaties. So, I'm not apologetic about having sympathy for the European integration project and showing this in my work. But that doesn't mean that I think we shouldn't keep a critical distance from the work of the EU institutions and from the views expressed by legal practitioners in the academic domain. Now that distance, that critical distance comes most naturally when academics write about the kinds of things which practitioners don't write about and are nevertheless important for the construction of knowledge about EU law, such as theoretical reflections on the nature of the European legal order, or on the significance of the constitutional approach to the study of EU law. But the critical distance should also be there when scholars engage in their main activity, which is to explain and comment on what's going on concretely in the field of EU law. The critical assessment can be both internal and external. The internal one is by those who work on questions of EU legality, on the legal quality of the reasoning in a judgment or of a legal choice made by the institutions. Now this kind of critique, so what I call the internal critique, is all over the place. All EU legal scholars practice it. In fact, I really wonder why it is still said that most EU legal scholars uncritically support the Court of Justice. Because if one looks at case comments in any of the EU legal journals, the majority of them are quite critical of the Court's reasoning. To simply reiterate what the Court decided and to silently approve its reasoning has become the exception. And it's indeed frowned upon in academic circles. Critical comments have become the rule and have become a sign of scholarly distinction. Personally, 
I like to be able to praise the court when I think it gets it right and criticize it when I think it gets it wrong in its legal reasoning. For example, I basically supported the court when commenting together with Thomas Bökers on the Pringle judgment about European stability mechanism or together with Lilian Surdi on the refugee relocation judgment. But I strongly criticized when I wrote together with Shaila Imamovic on the opinion 2 slash 13 on accession of the EU to the ECHR, I should say of non-accession to the ECHR, which I criticized for being, in my view, a weak, weakly reasoned and very self-serving opinion. Now, what I just said about the court is also true for the work of the other EU institutions. When new EU legislation is proposed or adopted, scholarly analysis in the law journals is more often than not accompanied by critique of the legal logic or the consistency of what is being done. And then we have the external critique of the functioning of the EU institutions, which is less common but growing, a growing part of legal scholarship. External critique looks at the conditions under which EU law rules or judgments emerge. So not so much at the legal reasoning, but at what is behind it, the conditions under which the law has been made, or at the impact that the law has on social reality, both inside and outside Europe, at the distributive consequences of EU law. This work looks at European law in its broader political, economic, or cultural contexts, and often engages with interdisciplinary approaches. In many academic settings, including the Netherlands, this kind of work is nowadays encouraged. In some countries, in many countries perhaps, it's still frowned upon because considered not to be the proper way of doing legal research. But this fact, it, this is an internal dispute within the academic world. This is not because of any pressure from the side of the European institutions. Indeed, my feeling is that European Union legal scholars these days in most European countries are freer than ever in choosing the object and method of their research, of doing doctrinal work or law and context work, in being supportive of what the European Union does or not. European law today is therefore, in my view, a pluralist academic field, and that is a precious thing. Dear Dean, dear colleagues and friends, Having almost finished my lecture, I'm now coming to the valedictory part of it. That's the farewell part for those of you who've never heard the word valedictory. It's one of those quaint words which the Dutch university tradition is fond of, even in English translation. The institution of the farewell lecture is a, again one of those typical Dutch things which made me marvel when I first arrived here. I think I remember that on, on one of, in the first week when I arrived, there was a farewell lecture by, by a professor. I thought, oh, how strange is this? It's based on the idea that this is the last opportunity for the speaker to say something in public. Yeah? <laughs> to imprint on the audience his or her intellectual heritage before disappearing in the woods. Nowadays, as Jan Smits already said, it doesn't really work like that anymore. You know, emeritus professors are provided with a desk, with an email address, with printing facilities, if they like it. And most of them do, and so do I. And therefore, I do not need to be very tearful uh, now for the fact that I will never see you all again, because the chances are that I will see you again either at this university or at some academic event elsewhere. Still, it is appropriate to serve the tradition and by looking back at my trajectory to recall some of the phases in that trajectory and people who accompanied me along it. This university was still called, when I first arrived here in 1989, it was still called Rijksuniversiteit Limburg, or as the locals would abbreviate it, the Roll. <laughs> and it didn't have a name in English. It has since been transformed into the bilingual Maastricht University. 
which is proven by the fact that we, I speak English here without even having justified that choice. That transformation started in the early 1990s, around the time that the Maastricht Treaty was being negotiated across the river. And it went on relentlessly, because when I started here, only four or five of us were dealing with European law. And now there may be about 50 academics just at the Faculty of Law here who are interested in European law and write about European law. There are many specialized courses, and the composition of the staff and the students is now very European. Now, the steps leading to this transformation were recounted recently by Hildegard Schneider in her own farewell speech a few months ago, and I don't need to rehearse them again. Let me just say that this faculty has been particularly generous to me because I have been unfaithful to it. When Jan Smith said that I've been here for 33 years, that's not the exact truth. Because in 2000, after 10 happy years spent in Maastricht, I left to work in Florence at the European University Institute. When my term came to an end there in 2010, so 10 years later, I looked around for my next job. And the Faculty of Law of Maastricht, through its dean, Alt Willem Heringra, kindly lured me back to this institution, which in the intervening 10 years had changed so much. I found myself then in 2010, and still today, surrounded by a true dream team of European Union scholars. The best collection anywhere in the world, I think. I, I used to say that, but I, I actually mean it. <laughs> the composition of that dream team has changed over the years. Some of them went on to develop their careers at other universities, or indeed at some EU institution, but are still very much friends of Maastricht. Others have arrived since then. They are active participants in the European law debate, and it's, it's, a, it's a kind of source of pride to open the latest issue of a European law journal and to see that, once again, it contains a contribution by a scholar based in Maastricht. I also would like to recall the many, often very talented, undergraduate students that I've met here, and the many doctoral students who I accompanied for a few years of their careers, both here and in Florence. I confirm that one of the nice parts of being a university professor is to meet, usually at this time of the year, a fresh group of students and a fresh group of doctoral researchers and to experience the intellectual buzz that comes with it. I should also like to thank the leadership of the law faculty throughout the years and also its administrative staff that have always been very supportive and both the leadership and the administration have been very supportive, have created this very nice and open intellectual climate that marks this faculty. I should especially like to mention um, Monica Klaas and Ellen Voss, my two closest colleagues, who have been here all this time and who were responsible for organizing the wonderful workshop, which was lots of fun, that took place here this morning. A secret workshop, at least secret to me, but a very nice one. I also thank all of you for showing up here this afternoon, including my dear family members. The lecture is over now. Ich hab gesagt. Well, many, many thanks for this wonderful lecture. Um, it made very much clear again to me and I think to everyone here in the audience um, why we are so sad that you officially, only officially indeed, retire uh, today. Um, I think this was a lecture in true uh, Bruno style, um, meticulous, carefully formulated, and yet stimulating and opening up new horizons and offering self-reflection. Um, thank you so much for this. Now, this is not the end of this ceremony. Um, this morning at the uh, secret conference organized by your close colleagues, Ellen Vos, Monica Klaas, 
Anne-Pieter van der Meij en Matteo Bonelli. Um, I learned something about you that I did not know before. And that is indeed that you like surprises, that you like secrets. So we have a few more um, for you still this afternoon. Before we get to those surprises, I would like to say a few more words uh, myself in my capacity as uh, Dean of the Faculty of Law. Um, the faculty that you indeed served for 33 years, and I think we can still debate whether you have been, in fact, unfaithful uh, or not, Bruno, because I think you still remained also here, at least uh, as an honorary professor, also during your time in, uh, uh, in Florence. Uh, that we also very much uh, uh, appreciated that you remained c connected um, to us. I'm going to be brief in what I have to say because I also know that we have colleagues sitting here on the first row who are very eager to address you um, as well. But I do want to go back to the start of your academic career here in Maastricht at least, um, as a graduate of Leuven University and the College of Europe at having defended your PhD with uh, Mauro Capelletti at the uh, European University Institute. You started at the faculty indeed in 1989. And yet yeah, those of you who have been here before at valedictory at, uh, lectures know that I then always bring or try to bring a document with me that testifies of the fact that you were indeed, well, applying for a position at this university. And indeed, also in your case, Bruno, I did bring the document. It's your um, application letter uh, for this uh, position, dated the 25th of Nove November, uh, 1988. Now, interestingly, I'm not sure if you, you probably cannot see that. Interestingly, it's written on the letterhead of the European University Institute, but the letterhead is in Dutch. Um, so it says Europees Universitair Instituut Afdeling Rechtswetenschappen. So apparently in 1988, the, uh, the Rul uh, did not have an English name, but the EUI did have a Dutch name. <laughs> um, so that's very nice, to, uh, very nice to see. The letter is addressed to Professor Kees Flinterman, um, I think at that time the chair of the Department of International Law. That was the proper name of the department. In that time, European law was not yet, had not yet been added to that name. Um, and uh, the letter was sent by making use of the latest technology available at that time, because it was sent by Telefax. Uh, the only thing is, Bruno, you did not seem to have a very, um, well, uh, high um, uh, uh, understanding, uh, you did have a high understanding, of course. You did not think very highly of uh, how technically advanced this faculty was at that time, because you indicate in the letter that you would also send a letter by regular mail, which was indeed also something that we received. I have here the, 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 the actual facts. So it, it, the facts did arrive here at the, uh, at the university. Um, with the regular letter, you also sent to Kees Flinterman a whole range of recent publications, um, which I think kept Kees busy reading for quite a, a while, because although your letter was sent in November 1988, it took the faculty until September 1989 to actually appoint uh, you. May also have been other reasons, <laughs> um, um, but that's what I, what I noticed. In the 30 years that followed, you, in my view, remained, uh, you remained very much loyal to, uh, uh, to Maastricht, and our next speaker, who that is, I have to keep a secret, and I understand. Uh, our next speaker will uh, uh, say more about that. There, there is one thing I would still like to do, um, and that is to highlight one aspect of your um, personality that has been very important to our faculty. Um, this morning at the symposium in your honor, it was concluded that we all know how important your contribution has been to our faculty and to the development of European law as a field of academic study um, in general. And I know that you feel very um, uncomfortable with others spelling uh, that out. So I will no longer do so. But there's one aspect of your personality uh, I do like to uh, highlight here. And I would like to call that your, your academic generosity, um, your academic kindness. I'm, I'm not sure if everyone 
in this room is aware, um, but if you would um, type in in Google search um, the keywords academics are dot dot dot. Um, I'm not sure that of whether everyone knows what you would then uh, uh, get in if you if you indeed uh, uh, turn on uh, turn on uh, auto complete. What you get there, and I can uh, indeed reveal that. What you get there are uh, as the first two words you get two you get the word arrogant, and the second word is the is the word self-centered. Now I'm I'm tempted to believe um, that legal academia is different. Um, I also am very much tempted to believe that our faculty is different, but I am sure um, that that is different in the case of uh, in the case of Bruno. All colleagues, indeed many of them present here today, uh, have experienced your intellectual and personal uh, generosity, um, your willingness to discuss their ideas, to comment on their work, to guide them in their academic journeys, careers, and uh, in the many choices one indeed has to make as an academic, uh, and also when it comes to one's personal development. Uh, and that academic generosity you have also abundantly showed uh, towards our faculty in many ways. Um, and let me just mention here one of those ways, which is the, 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 the role you have fulfilled in recent year also as a member of our very important faculty science committee. Uh, and also in your role of selecting uh, new PhD um, researchers. And I, I, I dare say here that in that respect, with this academic generosity, you have also been a role model to many, not only within our faculty, but also more generally in the, uh, uh, in the field of uh, uh, European law and beyond that field. Um, so thank you very much on behalf of our faculty of law um, for all of this. As I said, I'm not the only person addressing you today. Um, we have also colleagues sitting on the first row who are much better able than I am to say more about the important role that you have fulfilled and hopefully will still fulfill uh, with us in a different capacity. And it gives me therefore great pleasure to announce um, a speaker who would like to address you on behalf of the Department of now European and International Law, Professor Adam Vos. Okay, Bruno, I'm uh, going to speak a wor uh, some words for you and about you. Maastricht Florence, Florence Maastricht. Bruno has lived his academic career in these cities. First, Firenze, because we have to pronounce him Firenze. Bruno told me that as a teenager he saw a documentary about the European University Institute on television and decided that he wanted to go there. And so he did. After his law studies in Leuven and the College of Europe in Bruges, Bruno went to the European University Institute in Florence, in Firenze, I must say, to do a PhD, which he obtained in 1985. Then, as the dean already told us, he came to Maastricht in 1989, first as an associate professor and then as a professor of European law. So then, Maastricht. In Maastricht, Bruno stayed for 10 years, as he just uh, said himself, and then Firenze called him back. So he left Maastricht to take up the position of professor of European uh, law at the European University <coughs> Institute in Florin Florence in 2000. So not seven, but 10 seems to be a kind of holy number for Bruno. For again, after 10 years, Maastricht called him back. And to be sure, I'm not suggesting here any comparison with the biblical seven lean and fat years. This time, in 2010, Maastricht and Firenze decided to share Bruno. So Bruno was appointed for 0.7 here in Maastricht and for 0.3 in Firenze. So Maastricht and Firenze as the setting of Bruno's career, both cities with a rich history and tradition as the background of the academic career 
of a professor of European law. And what a career. Uh, Bruno Leschi, carefully studying, commenting, explaining, and criticizing EU law. Needless to once more, as we all did today already, emphasize that Bruno's sharp and fine analysis of a broad range of European Union law has been of invaluable importance for uh, EU legal scholarship. It all started with his PhD study on linguistic diversity and fundamental rights, including a study of comparative constitutional law and uh, international law. Bruno has produced, as we heard already today, Monica hinted at it as well, has produced over 250 publications in his career on a wide variety of topics. The constitutional law of the European Union, with a particular focus on the rela relation between international and European and national law, the protection of fundamental rights, lawmaking and treaty revision procedures, internal market law and non-market values. Also, the law of cultural diversity, with a particular focus on language law, the protection of minorities, and the relation between market integration and cultural diversity in European Union law. It is thus not surprising that Bruno is considered to be a true generalist of EU law, which is very rare today's, today. In his first period in Maastricht, Bruno was head of department of international and European law, which, considered it, which consisted in those days of 18 members, one eight. Today, actually, this is eight zero, uh, so uh, more than 80 uh, persons. Under his leadership, the study of European law, as uh, our dean already said, which first of, uh, did not exist, flourished, and he set up a team of EU lawyers. In his second period in Maastricht, Bruno tried to skillfully steer away from administrative duties. <laughs> Yet, we managed to convince Bruno to become co-director, together with me, uh, of the Maastricht Center for European uh, Law, MCEL. Uh, that was set up in 2011. Moreover, he, has also, he was also for many years member of the science committee of the faculty that advises the faculty board on science policies and the admission of PhD researchers. Moreover, he was member of the various selection committees of our PhD candidates throughout the years. In addition, he has been the external advisor of research programs of various faculties here in the Netherlands, but also abroad, and is still on the advisory board of many journals. He, more, he moreover is and has been member of the advisory board of research centers of St. Anna in Pisa, Louise in Rome, and European Studies in Salzburg. <laughs> and very recently, Bruno accepted to sit on Maastricht University's Committee for Scientific Integrity. <laughs> It is needless to say that it has been fantastic to work together with Bruno. <laughs> Bruno has always firmly, belie firmly believes to let all flowers grow and allow research to start bottom up and not to be stared, to be stared top down. In this, in this way, all researchers of EU law who have worked and uh, still work within MCEL have always been encouraged by Bruno to develop their own research. Not surprisingly, MCEL does not focus on specific areas of EU law, but studies the law of the European Union in a broad sense. And, as Bruno likes to emphasize, there is no other center in the whole world that has so many researchers uh, together who all study EU law. And I've recently also heard other colleagues confirming that claim, although I must admit, that their source was always Bruno. <laughs> <laughs> what is nice about Bruno is that he sees all academic writings as projects. For example, projects to write an article or a book on particular topics. He does not really think in terms of big prestigious project applications for funding. He also sees the values of publications that are not published in top journals. So instead of pushing young and senior colleagues to apply for project funding, 
He has always emphasized the need to have relevant projects for the writing of articles, edited volumes, and uh, books. This old school attitude has been quite refreshing in today's hectic academic life, which increasingly pushes scholars to raise funds for their projects and to publish in prestigious journals and with renowned, renowned uh, international uh, publishers. Bruno's approach to academia seems uh, therefore today very appealing, focusing on the true essence of academia, teaching, reading, thinking, writing, discussing with others, and leading then to the wish actually of us to set Bruno's old school as a standard for the new way forward in the academia, as Ruth Rubio Marin so nicely uh, phrased it already this morning. Bruno is not only a great legal academic, but is also a very humor, humorful for, uh, person. And that was also emphasized by many of the speakers uh, this morning. He likes to laugh and to be ironic, also in relation to his own work. It is this spontaneity with a healthy portion of self-irony that is so needed in the academic world to see academic life in a much simpler and fun way. Many discussions in the context of MCEL seminars and many meetings with Brun Bruno have therefore always been uh, both serious and fun. A picture of Florentine Maastricht with its vineyards forms the cover of the book Ma Making Sense of European Union Law, published by Hart Publishing, that Monica and I presented earlier today to Bruno. A liber amicarum to celebrate Bruno's career, looking at some of, many, of the many themes of EU law that Bruno has researched in his work. Our work as scholars for Bruno is to make sense of things. His own com contribution to, to the study of European uh, law is consistently well-informed, thoroughly researched, razor-sharp and elegantly worded. In, this, in essence, in fact, this book looks at Bruno's Europe. The authors of the book, many of them here present, reveal at the same time the many faces of the scholar Bruno, the generalist, the legal pra uh, pragmatics, uh, the pioneer, the trapeze artist, uh, the polyglot, the fox and the hedgehog, the eagle, all denominations used to highlight the eminence of his scholarly work. The contributions also reveal many faces of the person Bruno. Generous, responsive, inclusive, warm, sharp, engaging, critical, attentive, humorous, all adjectives used to depict the personality of Bruno. And it should be said, although it may be sh seem strange, one should add as well the adjective strict. Strict? You may ask yourself, Bruno? Uh, well, yes. I refer to Bruno's strictness in not allowing any cappuccino to be drunk after 11 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> to say no to cafe americano, no to lunches and dinners in restaurants that serve fluffy pasta, and no to pasta as a side dish. <laughs> so yes, Bruno is more Italian than most of the Italians working at our faculty. <laughs> and we have many of them. <laughs> An Italian colleague explained that this may be because Bruno has been more in Italy than uh, most of our Italian colleagues in the, in the <laughs> past years. For sure, we do all appreciate Bruno's Italian style. Bruno, it is great that you will stay on as an emeritus professor and that this is not your farewell but it's, uh, it's, it's hello again. <laughs> As Verle already said, nothing really has changed. The only thing that Bruno uh, is uh, not doing anymore is to teach in the course Advanced uh, European uh, Law. We all very much look forward to continue to work with you and reading your wonderful writings. Thank you, Bruno, for everything. As I said before, we, um, it has been wonderful to uh, work with Bruno. And how it is to work with Bruno brings me to yet another surprise. 
for Bruno. And to this end, I will hand over to my colleague, Anne Pieter van der Meij, and uh, my colleague, Matteo Bonelli. Please, you have the floor. Okay. Uh, dear Bruno, uh, earlier today, at the end of the seminar eh, that was organized in honor of you, Ellen and Monica offer you a liebe amicorum, or a liebe amicarum, I should say. Uh, it, all <coughs> it contains contributions by a number 13, 14, I think, female colleagues. Well, in the course of the last years, um, you have worked with many more people whom you have inspired, supported. And they include both men and women. Uh, many of these colleagues, they also want to express their gratitude towards you. And on behalf of them, many of them are present here today, we want to offer you another little present. And Matteo will say what it is and how it was made. You're not allowed to see it yet. Um, so this book, um, well, is entitled Working with Bruno. It collects um, around 40 contributions from, I counted, 13 um, nationalities, I can read them, North Macedonia, Greece, Italy, Sweden, Slovenia, Belgium, the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, France, Russia, Bosnia, Cyprus, and Germany, which gives a variety uh, uh, of, um, of the internationalization of Maastricht. Um, uh, we left to the authors, in fact, freedom uh, in terms of what they wanted to contribute, so you will find some contributions more on substance. Um, some that tell an experience of working with you in Maastricht and some that tells, well, their encounter, their encontro with Bruno. Um, you find examples of those three. Um, you also find contributions in different languages, something that should resonate with you. So you find English, Dutch and French as well. Um, and let me briefly highlight, and it will be very brief, three elements that come up with the contributions. And I would repeat, in fact, what both Jan and Ellen have already said. Well, first, Bruno, they show how you left a mark on different generations of this faculty. Um, so there are stories on you launching or contributing to launching the European teaching programs of the faculty back in the early 90s. Then you return to Maastricht in the, 2000s, in the 2010s, and you're, for example, at the launch of the Maastricht Center for European Law. And then also the younger generation is there, uh, and you are still today, in fact, acting as PhD supervisors for some of our authors. And um, every one of us, even the younger of us, still see you as a, as a mentor, a colleague, and a friend. Um, so we could say that even if you spend a bit too much time in, in, in Florence for our liking, uh, the faculty would not have been the same without you. The second point is that the book once again shows how many topics you have covered in your, in your career. Um, as one of our contributors put it, regardless which topic you're working on in EU law, at one point you're bound to come across the writing of Bruno. And this is shown by the fact that people have written on the delegation of powers in EU law, EU environmental law, fundamental rights, data retention, they've all mentioned your work. Um, and finally, and most importantly, I think the book brings to light the personal qualities of Bruno as a colleague, mentor, PhD supervisor, friend. You have touched the lives of many, if not all of us, Bruno, always in a kind, supportive, and positive way. So working with you, Bruno, has been a real pleasure, and we're very grateful for that. Grazie. Let me also mention the cover. I think you would recognize it. It's a view from Bruno's office, so you will not miss this view in the next days. You can have a look at it, even in your, in your new office. And I think we should call you now. Well, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. Um, we are slowly reaching the end of this event, um, and I want to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, if you are watching online, uh, I suggest that you propose a toast to Bruno, 
Um, and I also want to thank Joshua and Luke for taking care of the, uh, of the live stream that we have had during this ceremony. For everyone present here uh, in the Ola, um, on behalf of uh, Bruno, um, I am allowed to invite you all to the reception. The reception does not take place in this building. It takes place at the Brasserie Tapijn, which is only a five minutes walk uh, from this uh, main university building. Um, you can find it at Tapijn Caserne 2020. But the more important thing to do is simply to follow everyone else if you do not know where that is. Um, when leaving this uh, Ola, please allow uh, Professor De Witte, together with his wife and children, to go first, followed by the cortege. And with this, I do close this academic ceremony.